So just to uh, explain the format uh, to everyone, um, I would like to uh, give a moment to all of our panelists to introduce themselves, uh, give us uh, you know, just a very brief overview or at least uh, uh, some indication of the area that they do their research in, um, how long they have been at the University of Michigan. Um, and um, then after that, we will move on to the questions from uh, the audience. Uh, there is a Slido uh, link, if uh, you haven't seen it already, where you can ask questions and vote on questions. I will go through those and uh, select them and ask them uh, from our panelists. Uh, but if anything comes up, feel free to add more questions as we go. Uh, and then we'll try to go until about 1.50 Eastern time, at which point we will take a little break uh, and then again, go into the different breakout rooms and uh, uh, assign some of uh, our faculty, our panelists uh, to those breakout rooms. So you have, a, you have a chance and opportunity to perhaps ask them some of the more uh, directed questions uh, then. I hope that sounds great uh, to everyone. Uh, so what I will do is I'll just uh, call on you uh, to introduce yourselves in no particular order other than the order in which I see you in Zoom. And that might not be the order that you will see yourself in Zoom, just uh, note that. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Jenna. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jenna Weens. I'm an associate professor of computer science and engineering and the co-director for uh, the Preci Precision Health Initiative at the University of Michigan. And I'm part of the AI lab. I head the machine learning for data driven decisions group where we develop and use machine learning techniques to improve healthcare. And I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, Mark, you are next. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Guzdial. Uh, I am also a professor in computer science and engineering. Um, I'm in the interactive systems lab. And uh, I think we got here, what was it, Nicola, last week or something like that? A couple years ago. Still trying to find our bearing. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, Hasha, you're next. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Harsha Madhyasta. Uh, been at Michigan for, I think, six years now. Uh, time flies. Uh, my, my research is broadly in the area of distributed systems and networking. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've also been part of the program committee for the Masters in Data Science program. So if any of you have any questions on that front, happy to answer that too. And I've also been serving for the last couple of years in the department's uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, committee. So, any questions on that front? To I would be happy to answer that. Excellent, thank you, Harsha. And this, we have uh, quite a few questions about that as well. So it's it's great to have you. Um, all right. So now, uh, let's see who is next. We have two left. Emily, would you like to go? It's me. So hi, I'm Emily Provost. <laughs> I'm in both um, AI and interactive systems. I've been here for about eight and a half years now, nine years in January. And my group is really interested in how you can use speech to understand behavior. So we do work in emotion. We're interested in how speech also tells us something interesting about someone's health, either mental or physical. And we've been looking at how you can design new algorithms to just get a better sense of how someone's behavior changes when you get outside of the lab and into the world. Oh, also I'm uh, the chair of our graduate program. So I'd be happy to take questions about that as well. Thank you, Emily. And Manos. Hi, everyone. I'm Manos Capritos. I'm an assistant professor. I've been at Michigan for about three and a half years now. Um, and I work in the software systems lab, uh, mostly doing work on distributed systems and form verification and fault tolerance. Uh, and I've been, uh, for the last couple of years, I've been part of the graduate committee. Uh, so, so any questions related to that, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Great, and again, thank you all for joining us for this, this panel. So uh, I will just uh, switch here to um, the questions that we got uh, from the audience. Uh, there's a lot of great questions here. Um, I do wanna start with uh, some of the easier ones just to get you warmed up before we move to some of the very important ones, but challenging and, and difficult ones. 
Um, so let's uh, take a look here. Um, so, oh, where did they go? Uh, what happens as you're voting for these questions, uh, they change their order and it looks like you uh, all downvoted um, this particular question since the last time I looked at it. Uh, no, I, I'm joking. So this is this is perhaps uh, an easy one um, where um, one of our audience members asks, "What what separates University of Michigan uh, CSC department from some of the other uh, departments out there uh, at other top universities?" Um, and I would open this one up. Uh, whoever sort of wants to go first. Everything. So <laughs> anyways, uh, Michigan's a great place. And it's a great place not only for the people and the really cool research that happens here, but I think one of the things that I personally find most exciting about Michigan and specifically Michigan CSE, Computer Science and Engineering, is the focus and the embrace and the respect for in interdisciplinary collaborative research. I think that this type of research is really inspiring because it allows us to answer questions that are not only relevant in the domain of computer science, but really asks about impact beyond how what we could how what we do really um, influences how other people think about computing, how other people think about health, how other people think about so many things, and the fact that this is a core a core component of the work that we do at Michigan, I think, is what sets us apart. anyone like to add anything to that one or should we move on to some of the burning questions that everyone has about uh, the applications so I guess one, one thing I want to say kind of uh, compared to a few other um, programs that I've seen I think uh, Michigan has a pretty um, Kind of a, a, a developed culture of actually getting students engaged in research uh, right away, uh, which uh, I have not actually seen in, 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 I mean, it exists in some of the departments, but there is a kind of a, a big focus of, uh, of kind of research being the primary thing that you're doing. Uh, and that's kind of a combination of a reasonable load of, of classes and, and, and a, a kind of a structure of the, of, the, of the program being developed in a way to make sure that people get kind of in their, in their, in their research, um, kind of the first research project gets um, started right away and, and is like as successful as, as we can make it. And that's kind of one of the things that I've actually seen gets people engaged quickly and, and makes them successful for the rest of the, of the program. Thank you. I think those those are really, really good um, answers. So I, I would like to uh, switch to a lot of questions that we have about uh, the uh, not so much the application process, but more uh, about what you all look for uh, in an applicant. What do you look for on a statement of purpose when you are um, when you are uh, considering applicants, uh, do you consider whether they contact you up front uh, or not? Uh, and I don't know, uh, maybe uh, uh, Jenna, would you like to take uh, this one? Sure. Yeah, happy to. Um, so what I look for, I think we all look for um, similar things and different things at the same time. Um, I uh, focus a lot on um, research interests, but not necessarily perfect fit. Um, so oftentimes in a research statement, well, one, the different components of a research of your application um, involve a, uh, a statement of purpose where you're going to describe what type of research you're interested in. Um, and you're not necessarily tied to this um, statement of purpose, but it does help us in terms of sorting um, research interests and fit. Um, and what I look for is someone who, who overlaps with my research interests um, 
and also someone who has persevered. Um, so I am drawn towards applicants who have faced some sort of challenge, maybe they had a paper rejected or um, they did poorly in their first year and then overcame that challenge um, because Research is, a, is very challenging. There are a lot of ups and downs um, and being able to overcome those challenges and persevere is a really important quality um, for a good researcher. So that's, that's one among many other things that I look for. Uh, Emily, raise her finger. Would you like to go next? Yes. I should do the full. Uh, the other thing, the thing that I look for is the thing I focus on most actually is in the statement of purpose. I'm really interested in how, in why someone is interested in something that's close to what I do. And so when I'm reading statements, I'm really I'm looking for someone who I think I would love to have a conversation with about these topics. Someone who's telling me why they're deeply inspired by this research question. Because as Jenna mentioned. The research process, I, I've always described it like a sine wave, but someone recently told me that's also what a roller coaster looks like. So fair enough, a roller coaster where, um, you know, it's, it's so exciting and you're, you're getting these amazing results and you're getting to a publication and you have really understood where your problem's going. And then you start the next problem and nothing works. And what you have to do is make sure that what you get when you're down here and nothing's working, you still have the, the willingness to commit your time to go back up again. And so to me, when I'm reading these research statements, it's sort of a way for me to understand that someone is intrinsically motivated in the topics that I care about so that when they do hit these low points, they're going to want to continue to find an answer. And so that's kind of what I'm looking for too. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, Harsha. So you, you have been involved with the, the with the master's program, right? Um, and I think what we heard uh, from Jenna and Emily was maybe uh, more targeted towards PhD students. What about what about master's students? What are we looking for? Yeah. So masters, at least I would say the admissions are, are largely bimodal. Like if, if if you're coming from a really good school with a high GPA, then that you kind of almost that's an easy way to get in, but if if, if you are not coming from a, a well-known school and your GPA is not great, still the statement can make a huge difference because if you can articulate why you're really passionate about getting into graduate school and why you are not just pursuing this as as a as a way to not be a, a software engineer, but you have some intrinsic motivation to do this. Uh, that can really persuade the committee to kind of uh, overlook maybe other considerations. Uh, so, so I would say, I mean, this is probably true for, I mean, I should say definitely true for PhD application applicants too. I, I personally, when I admit students, I, I really look for, does this student know why they're applying to grad school as, as, as opposed to just following maybe someone else advise them do this and and they're going along. Uh, so that's true for both M masters and PhD applicants, I would say. Mark, it seems like you were agreeing with uh, quite a bit of what we heard. Hey, are, is there anything else that you would add? I, I'm basically just a bobblehead. <laughs> yeah, um, I, my, my area is kind of niche. So it might be a bit different than, uh, than, than Jenna and Emily in that I do computing education research. So part the, 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 the theme that particularly struck me with what Harsha was saying was that I want to see why you want to go to graduate school. Um, and it's particularly relevant for me that students have had prior research experience. I want to know that you know what you're getting in for. Um, you probably know the ROI, the return on investment for your master's is really good. You spend another year or two, you'll make a much higher wage. You spend several years in PhD, compared to staying out in industry, you'll never make it up, right? So you've got to really be bought in. And particularly in my area in computing education research, I want to know that you know what that is and that you've had research experience and know what you're getting into. Um, that, that's pretty important to me. 
on us. Any thoughts? I just want to. I want. I want to second what Mark said. It is really important. And that's actually what I'm looking for in in, in a statement of purpose. Purpose. Do you like? Is there an actual reason why you're pursuing a PhD? Uh, it, it, my experience says that people that actually start with that reason, you know, firmly in mind, preferably they actually write it down in some notebook that they can go and look at later. You know, when they when the hard time come, comes, just those are the people that that really do persevere through the hard times because it is inevitable that hard times will come during the PhD. Uh, this is much less true of the of, of the master's degree. It is much you know, I mean, of course, there could be it could be hard time. You know, there's still a lot of workload, but the PhD is a different beast altogether, and it takes a lot of perseverance. So that's really what I look like. Someone that is consciously doing this, not just following the, you know, I, you know, I got my, I, I was, I was good at, at school, so I'm gonna do a PhD. That's not a good enough reason. And there was a related question. Uh, so you, you talked quite a bit about what, what you might be looking at uh, from the perspective of statement of purpose, but what about getting in touch with students and how, how can they actually get in touch with you? Uh, there were some questions about uh, should they directly email professors? How, 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 how should they go about it? So I, I think it's, it's fine to email professors. I would say email me once you've applied, right? Um, we receive a lot of emails before we even see an application and there's very little we can do with that. Um, but once you've applied, I can go in and I can take a look at your application. Um, so that would be my advice. That's a very good advice actually. Um, Harsha, were, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I was going to add that even before applying, if you email uh, any faculty member, at least I, I find it's most helpful if you if you make it personal, like show that you have maybe read some of my papers and you that there's a reason you're emailing me as opposed to others. Uh, particularly like just this week, I had an email saying, hey, I want to work with you at the University of Southern California. So that clearly shows me, okay, you didn't meant to email just me. And uh, so if, if you do email faculty that do take care and in crafting your email. Yeah, don't address me as dear sir. I've gotten those. <laughs> I, I actually, um, I, I'm gonna agree with both Jenna and Harsha, but I also really like it when students reach out to me like a year before. So this is, you're, you're, you're looking around, um, you want some advice. There's a lot of undergraduates I've talked to who say they're interested in the area. Could I advise them on where they should apply, me or elsewhere? I'm happy to take those sorts of conversations. It's kind of fun to talk about where your match is across the country. It also perhaps gives us an opportunity to to help students prepare uh, their applications better. Um, so yeah, bo both uh, great, great advices. Um, anything else to add on contacting professors? Because uh, there's something else that uh, a lot of uh, our audience members asked about and Mark almost alluded to, um, and that is, interdisciplinary research. I think there's a lot of interesting questions there. But I, I want to first start with asking kind of a broader question of, is, is there really such a thing as inter, interdisciplinary research at uh, CSC, at the University of Michigan? Uh, and Mark, because you brought it up that you are interdisciplinary, you want to you wanna go and try and answer that one? I did. I'm pretty sure it was Emily who talked about interdisciplinary. She's right there next to you. Um, Emily is next in line, believe ah, Okay, all right. Um, yeah, there, of course, there's interdisciplinary research at University of Michigan. I think that in particular, there's a lot of collaboration between CSE and the med school. Um, and also probably the, the School of Public Health, though I'm less aware of that. Um, just because, you know, we've got a great med school, one of the top public health programs in the country. Um, if you want to do things with computing and health, this is a really terrific place to do it. Um, I am a, uh, a courtesy appointment also in the School of Information. 
So I have a, the title of Professor of Information, which I think is a pretty cool title. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that goes on between SI and CSE. And all of SI, I mean, for the most part, is interdisciplinary. You, I mean, what is information? Well, it's about connections across. Um, so I think that you can find a lot of that across the campus, University of Michigan. I, I do, I do want to ask more about that uh, healthcare angle that, that you uh, uh, pointed out, both from Jenna and Emily. But there's another thing that I also wanted to ask Emily about, because you, uh, Mark, brought up this uh, connection between CSC and SI. But what about CSC and ECE? Uh, and wh what's the difference? <laughs> so uh, there, there are a lot of differences. And then when you get closer to the overlap, some of those differences become more subtle. So to say actually just straight out, every single one of my degrees is electrical engineering. And now I find myself in a computer science department. So clearly there, there is a period of overlap, particularly when you're talking about um, systems, the system side, anything doing with, again, information um, or signal processing, there tends to be a lot of, of overlap and machine learning. And so my first student, it was an ECE student. And I have a student now also who's an ECE student. And so there are some really great questions that exist right at the overlap. And actually another one of my students is a CS student, but I think um, could just as easily be an, a signal processing uh, focused program instead. And so I think that the question, the question that, I think the question that you should be asking really when you're trying to decide where to apply, which I'm assuming is, is the motivation behind that question. It's not, it's not so much what should my degree be called? I think all of these degrees have great potential for future employment. The question really is, who am I most excited about working with? And you should apply to the department, assuming you have the background so that you'll be able to get into that program, but you should apply to the program where you feel most aligned with the people in that program. And if there are multiple departments with people that you're excited about, apply to those departments. Because really, I think the biggest thing when you're thinking about where to apply and then when you're really deciding where you want to go is who do i gravitate towards because the phd it's a long process as you know we've alluded to already and you really want to make sure that there's alignment not only in terms of topic but in terms of personality in in terms of the milestones that are relevant to the program because you, you just want to make sure that you're setting yourself up to given given that it's it's hard already you want to make sure you're setting yourself up for as smooth a sailing as possible. And so if the decision is CS versus EE, I, I'd argue that's less meaningful than who is in each of the places and what, what flavor their research brings to the questions you care about. That's great because you also answered another question that, that somebody posted and it was about, uh, I'm interested in both in SI and CSC, where should I apply? And I think this, this also already answers that as well. Um, but uh, I wanted to then go back to um, some of these collaborations that happen, uh, obviously, uh, with, with other parts of, of University of Michigan, but maybe some, some of the other entities like uh, uh, medicine. Uh, and Jenna, I know you have a lot of uh, collaborations going on. Would, would you be able to tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah. So as Mark mentioned, um, we have a top med school, but we also have a top hospital. Um, and it's filled with clinicians with interesting um, challenges uh, that are ripe for AI solutions. So um, I sit in CSC, we develop machine learning techniques, we ultimately aim to make contributions to CS, but we are very inspired by challenges in healthcare. Um, there are very rich data, multimodal data, so everything from physiological time series data to imaging data uh, to work with. And at the same time, while we're making contributions to machine learning, we can solve some um, problems in healthcare and improve patient outcomes. Um, so that's also what keeps me motivated um, in those research lows that Emily was talking about, uh, the promise of um, improving um, society and people's lives. Oh, that, that's a great answer. And then uh, I just wanted to also touch on this, maybe it wasn't uh, directly asked in questions, but I'm curious, what, what about collaboration with uh, 
industry. I don't know, Manos or, or Harsha, would you like to maybe touch on that? Uh, you might know more about what's happening at the, at the University of Michigan about those kinds of collaborations. So we usually have, I guess it depends on, on the field. Um, my, my group has, for example, uh, collaborations with uh, Microsoft and Microsoft Research that is usually on the, you know, uh, it starts on the academic side, uh, or, you know, working on a, on a research project together. But then there is a lot of, uh, you know, the collaboration is, has, is multifaceted in the sense that we actually kind of sometimes work on the project together. Sometimes, you know, the students go over and do internships and it's much easier for them to actually bring the project down to the, to, you know, whatever products uh, Microsoft cares about. And, and that, that's it, that collaboration is, is helpful for both sides because you know, the company benefits from the ideas uh, and, and the research side, and we benefit from having a clear view of what's important to them and you know, how do we get to actually solve real world problems. Yeah, I mean, I, I can only speak on the system side. Uh, I, I know the systems lab, we have quite a bit of collaborations with, with industry. Uh, for example, with just my own research, I would say in the last couple of years, I've, I've quoted my students and I have co-authored papers with uh, Google, Facebook, Nutanix. So it's, uh, I mean, University of Michigan has pretty close ties with uh, most of the big, uh, I mean, interest uh, companies which have really large scale infrastructure. And, and the university is, is pretty flexible in terms of, in most of these cases, the students went off, did an internship, then they came back, they continued working with the companies. Yeah, in, in some of these cases, the students had like part-time appointments with the companies even after they came back. Uh, so this is, I think, a win-win for both the student in terms of getting a lot of good experience and almost be guaranteed an employment, place of employment when, once they graduate because the, the, the company then knows the, the student is good. And of course, having some real impact is gives you a lot of fulfillment in terms of doing a research. So you mentioned a lot of different research areas while you were talking about this, and there are some questions about, uh, you know, how how to pick a research area, what research area to mention in your application. Um, can you switch between different research areas? So maybe, maybe we can spend a little bit of time uh, on, on that. Um, and I don't know who to call on in particular, but Jenna made this uh, easier for me and then Emily also uh, raised her hand. Okay, great. Thank you. Jenna, you wanna go first? Yeah, I, I just in terms of advice, I would say um, be keep an open mind. Um, so you don't wanna list all of the areas in your research statement but you also don't wanna be so specific um, that you're really only interested in working with one person on this one problem and that's it. Because maybe that person is not taking on students that year, maybe there's some funding in that area. Um, so I would say um, keep, tr try to keep an open mind um, when writing your statement of purpose, but also write about what you're excited about. Um, and again, you're not, uh, you're not tied to your statement of purpose um, or what you say you're going to do there. So that, that gets you in the door. And then during visit weekend, you get to meet with faculty and discuss research topics and you could change your mind then um, and that's totally okay. Yeah, as a, as a personal anecdote, uh, so I, <laughs> I was very, very inspired by Star Wars when I was writing my statements and I really wanted to create Luke Skywalker's hand. That was what I wrote every single essay about. I just, that's what I wanted to do. I was really excited about designing control for robotic hands, robotic, robotic prosthetic hands. And so I think I even decided to write that statement before I even looked at various universities. And so then the only places I applied were places with robotics programs and the place so then when I got in, I went, you know, I went to the different, the different universities and was talking to people there. And I ended up going to USC, University of Southern California. So maybe I was the one who emailed Harsha. Um, and so then when I was talking to the people who would be my advisor, the one, uh, the one who was in um, human robot interactions, HRI, 
she said, you know, we don't do prosthetic hands, but if you're interested in HRI instead, you could come work here. And so I, I was, I decided to totally switch topics. So away from, uh, away from this idea of prosthetic limbs to thinking about HRI. And then as it turns out, once you get into a PhD program, that's also not the last time that you have to decide if you wanted to switch. Because I was working in, I was working in this area for a few years. And by working, I mean obsessing with the details and not making very much progress. Until finally, I decided to internalize all the feedback I'd been getting from people, which is maybe you've chosen an area that is a little bit too large. And I narrowed down entirely to speech emotion recognition. And so my essays were about prosthetic hands. My PhD was about emotion recognition from speech. And so, yes, there's a lot of flexibility. Sometimes, frankly, the flexibility comes from making a decision midway through the process to switch who you'll be working with. But sometimes if it's, if it's a, close enough, uh, a close enough jump, you can just switch topics too. And so you're certainly not tied to a specific topic of whatever it was you wrote your essays about. In fact, I think for most of my students, I couldn't even tell you what they wrote their essays about. And I guess just to, to add on that, um, you're not tied to any topic and you're also not necessarily tied to any individual faculty. Uh, there's plenty of students that, that you know, they start working with some faculty and if that relation is not, is not working for either party, then they decide to move on. And that's something that's perfectly okay, perfectly acceptable. It's fact, in fact, it's encouraged if, you, you know, if that's not the, the best place for you to be, if you'd rather work with someone else, then that's exactly what you should be doing. You know, just because you started working with some faculty, you're not like married for life. Jenna brought something interesting and said, um, maybe the faculty that you really want to work with is not taking students. How do students or how do applicants know who is taking students and who isn't taking students? How do you find out? Um, again, uh, if anybody can make this easier on me, otherwise I have to pick on Mark. <laughs> ah, there we go. Ask them. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll take that, the, those questions. Um, I, you know, and when you ask them, it's not just you take any students this year, um, describe yourself and what your interests are a little bit, because uh, there had certainly been years where, nah, I don't think I really want to expand my group at all. And then I get an applicant that's right up my alley and somebody that I've known before because they've contacted me previously. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll be interested. Um, so I wanted to make a slight twist to the jumping between areas. It's it depends on your area, you know, it's easy if you're going into, uh, easy, I don't know, quotes, um, robotics or AI, we have several great faculty in those areas. Um, if you're interested in computing education research, yeah, it's probably going to be me. Um, and so we're going to have to have, we're going to have to be able to, to get along. I mean, you can always jump to do something else, but if this is the area that you want, there's not a whole lot of uh, other faculty to connect with in CSC. Um, it's a really balancing point in writing your statement of purpose. You want, I mean, to, if you're excited about Luke Skywalker's hand, I mean, it's great to communicate that passion and what you want to do and that you have interest and you see why it connects to these particular faculty. That's what you want to do. But what you don't want to do is come across and say, I'm doing this and only this and I won't do anything else. Because then it's like, yeah, well, if nobody's interested in that. You're not going to get in. You got to say you got to show the passion, but also show a willingness to say. I mean, a PhD is all about learning, right? You're growing. You're going to expect to change your focus. You're going to expect to narrow your focus. I shared in the chat the Matt Might Illustrated Guide to a PhD, which I think is like the thing to understand what a PhD is about. Yeah, I think just to follow up on that again, like that's why the statements are so important because it is your chance to say this is why I'm interested in this question. This is how I think about research. These are the types of, of problems that explore. These are the things I might be interested in following up on. And so again, if you were really specific and wrote something that no one else in the department even did, uh, you can still be of interest. It's just a matter of, of conveying what that might look like. And you should do your homework um, and know who does what at the institutions that you're applying to. Um, and I would call them out in your statement. So list the faculty that you're interested in working with because 
we have um, a mechanism to search for our names when reviewing applications. Um, and that's a really easy way to find people uh, where there might be a good fit. So that basically, I, I think the answer to uh, how do you know uh, if somebody's taking students is contact them. And I would just perhaps also say maybe contact even their students. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the uh, graduate student panel uh, later on. Um, th there was a question um, that I want to maybe circle back to because I think it's a, it's a very specific question about the uh, uh, SUGS pr uh, program at you know, uh, University of Michigan and I don't know Harsha maybe you, you can tell us just a little bit more about it uh, briefly uh, and uh, also what what do you look for in students uh, who are applying to that program? And maybe we can expand that later on more discussion about just very quickly, you know, are GREs important? Are GPAs important um, for, for, for those students? So, I mean, I'm, I'm not personally involved in SUG, so I, I, maybe Emily could actually say better than uh, more accurate information, but my understanding is uh, it, it's only a program for those who are currently undergraduates at, at uh, the university already. Uh, and uh, it's meant to be a, a way for you to get a master's with one more year at school, as opposed to if you go to a different school, then maybe you would have to put at least a year and a half or two years to get a master's. Uh, and and Best I know, as long as you have a good GPA and you, you have at least a couple of uh, faculty who are willing to recommend you, you, you should get in. I, I, I believe, uh, especially this year too, the GRE has been made uh, optional in, in graduate admissions. Uh, but yeah, I, I think maybe I should defer to Emily on this. Uh, I don't know to put her, put her on the spot, but maybe she knows more accurate information. Uh, so the, the one who actually is in charge of the SUGS program at uh, NCS is, is Quentin Stout, who unfortunately is, in, is not here. Uh, but, but yeah, exactly what Harsha said. The idea is that when you, you hit certain um, uh, achievement points in terms of GPA, then it's a relatively straightforward path to getting admitted to the program. And the idea is that it's a streamlined master's program. But we can follow up with details, more details if, if necessary. Okay, so um, no, this this is really great information. I hope it's it's really great for our audience as well. Uh, but there is a set of questions that I really want to uh, move to right now, uh, and uh, I am leaving them for the last. But it doesn't mean that they are not important. They're actually exceptionally uh, important. Uh, now, it's really great to. Uh, uh, have uh, a lot of you who are actually involved with diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Uh, some of you also serve on the uh, DEI uh, uh, committee. So it's, it's great to have you here and maybe we can tackle some of these um, questions uh, as well. Um, and the one that I would like to start um, off with is uh, a question that says, how does uh, University of Michigan make sure that people from marginalized backgrounds in terms of race, gender, disability, and sexuality feel supported and welcomed? Um, and uh, perhaps, uh, I, I know Emily, uh, uh, Harsha, both of you are on the DEI committee. Emily, may, would you like to... Uh, you're involved with the initiatives though, right? Yeah, I don't mind commenting. I'm just, I'm actually Please. not part of the DEI committee. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, um, I'd, I'd love to hear from Harsha too, who actually is part of the committee. I, mean, I can start, it doesn't matter. Um, so part of what we do in part of, especially uh, as the pandemic has been hitting, but just in general, I think that one of the most important things that we can do is listen. Because I think as academics or humans, I think that there's this big impulse to try to say things like, oh, I am a person who has challenges. And so therefore I understand your challenges and I understand what you need to make those challenges more palatable. And I think that that's a step to just doing things that aren't very helpful. I mean, sometimes it works out. Sometimes whatever challenges they are are sufficiently universal that those strategies are effective. But I think the most important thing and the thing that, that we've been really focused on is trying to build bridges with individual communities so that instead of speaking in the abstract about strategies that might make people feel more welcome or more included, 
we actually understand the problems because once you understand the problems, you can start to build tailored solutions that, that people will feel represents them and their needs. And so this is something that we've been heavily involved in. I, mean, I, I started in this position in September. So we've been heavily involved in it since September. We have um, standing meetings with different student groups. And the goal really is to do not a lot of talking, but more listening to figure out what the biggest challenges are and how we might be able to address those through small local things. And so one of the, one of the things that has started this year, as an example, is this um, peer onboarding. I forgot the, the name that we've actually, that the students came up with. It was really great. Onboarding buddy. It's something like that. Um, and the goal there is to allow our incoming PhD students to understand what a healthy DEI climate would look like. And so that way, if students are encountering challenges, but don't really know anything else because they've just started in a PhD program, they have an outlet. Um, another thing that started this year, actually one of Jenna's students um, is co-starting it, is a wellness group, which is also designed as a peer mediation group that, again, is trying to uh, find ways to uh, sort of solve problems that might arise, again, through lots and lots of listening. So I think that, to me, the thing that I'm beginning to understand is so very important, or continuing to understand is so very important, is uh, just a lot of active listening and um, solutions based on things that we're learning. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Our strategy since, I mean, especially since last year has been uh, that we really need to better understand the concerns of the students. So for example, uh, Wes Weimer, who's been leading many of these efforts, last year he organized at least a couple, maybe more uh, what we call these town halls, where students uh, show up and we typically have the, the chair of the department, even some of the deans, uh, present there so that uh, it, it's meant to be an environment where everybody is, is, is welcome to raise any concerns without any uh, consequences. Uh, and, and having the, even the deans be present there is, is really important so that uh, even uh, those who are higher up in the, in the administration know what problems exist and, 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 and what measures need to be taken. Uh, some of the other things we have, we have been doing in terms of even understanding concerns is, is for example, over this past summer, uh, we had a staff member who's, who's part of the DEI committee talk to uh, every single PhD student in the program. I like spent 15 minutes, try to see what concerns they have with their uh, advisor or with their group and see what patterns emerge. Uh, we're still trying to make sense of this, this data, but uh, that's, uh, kind of part of the, the, the overall uh, effort towards just trying to understand even the, the concerns that exist. I would just add to that, um, the DI is really core to our values. Um, and beyond the grad committee, uh, this is something that comes up often at faculty search. Um, so faculty, I serve on the faculty search committee where we review applicants, not to graduate school, but to our faculty. Um, so people we, we plan to hire and there not only do, uh, does the application involve a DEI statement, um, we also listen again, going off of Emily's theme of active listening to the students um, and their feedback. So we have a round table after a uh, faculty candidate job talks where the students can ask them uh, questions and find out um, uh, what are their thoughts on how we can improve things like climate and what contributions they might make to climate um, in CSC. And that weighs very heavily in, when making our decision. I want to add to that would be actually just to, to in, uh, increase the participation of the graduate students in the, in the, in the, in the search process, which is critical for, for maintaining the DI climate. We actually have, as of this year, a graduate student representative on the faculty search committee, just to make sure that the graduate student's opinion is always heard and that they have a voice, not just in the, you know, in the, in the abstract, but actually, you know, they have someone that, you know, kind of the, the, the searching um, uh, process is transparent and, and, and they, they, can, they can voice their concerns and opinions if they come up. 
and also aids in, in uh, transparency as well, because uh, then the students have more uh, visible. They, they, uh, some of the processes that are happening behind the scenes are more visible. This is great because you also uh, answered another question that we had, and that is, what has the department done uh, uh, in response to a lot of uh, challenges that we've been facing? Um, and you know things that put the uh, University of Michigan uh, in, uh, in general in news for, for all the, the bad reasons. Um, but I, I want to also ask another question. Uh, th this was a very interesting one. So, but what, what do we do to make sure that these kinds of issues are, are not disproportionately uh, uh, assigned to under underrepresented groups to deal with? Uh, uh, at CSC, because uh, every once in a while uh, we, we um, see cases where uh, members of these underrepresented groups are almost called on uh, to take part in panels, uh, committees, um, uh, to almost solve DEI issues. What, what do we do about that? I'll take it. Um... I think that it's really important that the DEI burden not fall on the members from underrepresented groups. Um, women faculty, uh, BIPOC faculty often have to pay a tax because they get asked so often to do these sorts of things. And that's just wrong. Uh, it's important. I think it's really cool that uh, several of us have mentioned Wes Weimer, who's really been very active in DEI. And like me, he's an old white dude. Um, it's a good thing. Uh, I think that it's really important that the burden be shared across all of the faculty, and I see an effort within CSE to do that. Yeah, I think, again, part of it is having conversations and building community so that people who are not in whatever, uh, whatever underrepresented group we're talking about also understand the problems. Because again, if, if people don't understand what the problems are and what the challenges are, it's really hard to figure out how to be a good ally. And whenever you say something like that, immediately, like a very fair reaction would be, well, that's still putting pressure on people from these underrepresented groups to be the educators. And so I think something that's been, I know personally very helpful um, this past spring uh, when we were um, thinking about how to support people going through uh, participating in the Black Lives Matter protests is the, the sheer quantity of reading lists and podcasts and other types of resources that were provided so that people in these groups didn't have to have these really hard conversations again, didn't have to explain all of the challenges they faced again. Instead, we could be pointed towards resources that would allow us to um, begin to understand what these conversations are looking like and begin to understand how else we could gain the information that we need to be supportive allies without asking people to uh, inform us. Thank you so much. It's, it's 1.50 um, and I know that there's so many questions that audience asked, so many great questions. We couldn't cover them all, but I hope we covered uh, a good majority of them. Uh, I hope that this was really good information for everyone. Um, I, I hope you learned something new. Um, let's, uh, let's thank all, all of our panelists, if nothing else, with that little uh, clap icon in.